the best way of describing how it's traumatised me is to say that it's so many years since I was in that industry and I still have sleepless nights probably two to three times a week. Can't sleep at all. My name is Susana and I used to work in a slaughterhouse in Mexico City. I was 15 years old when I started working in this place. My name's Carl Scott. In my early 20s, I worked in uh, Pukiuri uh, Slaughterhouse. My name's Doug. Uh, I've got a history of working in animal agriculture. I worked in three slaughterhouses as a butcher and a poultry farmer. My father was a hunter and he was a slaughterhouse worker. Dead animal bodies were just a routine thing. I grew up around dead and dying animals. Honestly, my earliest childhood memory, I'm not joking, is of a dying animal. My father, was, he shot a duck. Gosh, I must have been three years old or something. And this, this duck flapping, panicking, coming towards me and my younger brother, who must have been all of about two, and this duck was panicking and trying to escape, and I was terrified, and my dad was laughing, and he thought this was hilarious. At 16 years old, I left school, and, uh, and they had a scheme at the time. If you didn't have a job, you um, were offered this thing called a youth training scheme. I told them I wanted to work with animals. I thought maybe there'd be uh, some kind of farm work, like husbandry kind of thing, looking after animals or working at a dog shelter. Strangely, they thought it was appropriate to put me in as a butcher. So I was, I was to be an apprentice butcher with half of my time spent at butchers and the other half at an abattoir. I got this job through a friend. She was older than me, she was like 17. And he called my attention because he used to be at work that he used to start at three in the morning and finish like around seven in the morning. So I will have enough time to go to work and then go to school. My 20s, that was the 1990s, and unemployment was very high in New Zealand at that time. And my father had been working at Pukuri Freezing Works um, for many years, and he just happened to know the personnel officer at that plant, and uh, his name was Charlie Horn, and he spoke to Charlie one day and said, look, Charlie, my son's looking for work. Can you get him in? And, oh, I don't know, Dave. I'll see what I can do. But he did. He got me in. I didn't really know what to expect, and it was a bit of a steep learning curve the first week or two. But, yeah, it was, it was not a glamorous place to work. It was noisy and smelly, blood and guts, literally blood and guts, and all these dead bodies in, everywhere. It certainly wasn't my dream job. <laughs> And I remember for the first week, I'd be trying to go to sleep at night and I'd have all these images flashing through my mind of all these dead bodies. And, and the, I worked on a, a job called the gut trays, which was about as glamorous as it sounds, pretty horrible job, pulling apart all the internal organs of the sheep. But it only took, that's the funny thing, it only took about a week or two and it became my new normal. The very first thing they did before they even started me there was they had me witness the slaughter of a cow I think they must have been just gauging my reaction to see um, if I'd be appropriate to work there because I presume lots of people would see that and not be able to handle it. Uh, I remember feeling I'd got to not show any reaction because I needed work and I, I tried to hold in anything, anything emotional, any emotional response to that. Seeing it for the first time was very difficult and uh, shocking. I didn't have any expectation because, you know, like, I wasn't thinking about a work or I didn't know nothing about killing chickens. Like, I was just thinking, oh, it's a job. We'll see when we get there. They hired me first as a person to go and clean the chickens once they are dead. It was pretty stressful just because I had to, like, touch the chicken once they come out from the hot water and the body is like super hot. So it was pretty stressful because they don't even give you like gloves. And after a while, like there was, the person that was on the kill floor was in real like good at killing the chickens. They used to be alive still. So they switched me to the kill floor. The more I saw, 
the less reaction I got, I got used to it, I guess you could say. So I would, uh, the way I dealt with it was at the time I was really into my boxing and my um, weightlifting. So I saw it as a, a really good way of keeping strong and fit. If I was the guy who had to hold the hook through the cow's nose, so you, you're pulling up quite a heavy, uh, heavy animal. So it'd be like using the cables in a gym machine to do a, a lateral turn. So I'd be thinking of that exercise rather than the action that I was performing. There were moments when I saw things and I thought, oh, I don't like that. That's not nice. And on a couple of occasions, I didn't work on the kill floor, but a couple of times I went down to the kill floor and watched the animals being killed. And that was not nice. That kind of drove it home that this is an ugly business that I'm part of. At the time, I hardened up and just dealt with it. And sometimes reflecting back, I realised, gosh, what I saw there was disturbing. And I wonder how much it affected me that I didn't even realise. Injuries were multiple times a day, but it depends on the level of injury. So for example, when I first started in the slaughterhouse, I'd have to catch sheep and they basically put them, you pick them up, present them upside down on a rack. And uh, while, it, while you're holding it, someone would stun it with uh, electric shock and then cut its throat. And the amount of times I got electric shocks from the clamps hitting my hand rather than the sheep I lost count several times a day, every day. They show me how to kill the chickens with scissors or with a knife, you know, and with the knife it's pretty dangerous because you open the, the pick of the chickens and you place the knife and you just pull the knife back. And sometimes this person actually got injured because when you pull the, the knife to cut the throat, sometimes it will go through the chicken's head and it will cut your hand. So that was super dangerous. I was like, that's not for me. So I would use the scissors, which you open the pick of the chicken and just cut in the throat, and that was it. I did get injured one time when I was doing the knife. Like, I grabbed the chicken's head and I pulled the knife, but the chicken just moved the head, and so my hand was trying to grab it, and I, I punched myself on my on my elbow with the knife, so I still had the, the scar. I saw a lot of injuries. Um, it was very, very common. One thing I did saw that, see that was quite disturbing, there was a, a pelting machine, they called it. It was this big machine that pulled the skins off the sheep, and one of the workers got his hand caught in the machine, and um, he was screaming, ah, ah, the whole time, and he had some people that were trying to comfort him and calm him, and it took about 20, 30 minutes. They had to get the engineers up to come up and undo some bolts and, and partially dismantle the machine to get this guy's hand out of it. I'd say I was probably an alcoholic, and I, I drank heavily from the age of about 17, so, uh, which was... I started working in the abattoir at 16. It was connected with the job in a way that it you just... I guess you got to the end of the day and you wanted to forget what you'd been doing. I'd say pretty much everyone I worked with was drinking heavily. If you're violent in a workplace and then someone's potentially going to be aggressive towards you, it's going to be in for a shock when they, they, they uh, realise how far you can go. I remember one guy, I, I hit him so hard, he, he just clear, dropped down face forward, hit the floor, floor, and as I walked away, I looked back maybe 100 yards further up the road, he was still flat on his face. No idea what happened to him, but it was a, it was a good punch, I guess. But all kinds of things like broken noses, blood, whatever, and when you've seen the stuff you're seeing in a slaughterhouse, it's nothing. So it wouldn't, I wouldn't have any kind of emotional response to the violence. I think that my boss, the owner of the slaughterhouse, he used to suffer a lot with that because he was a very violent person. He would always be drinking, using drugs, like abusing his wife. And nobody can say absolutely nothing back to him. Sadly, his wife, we witnessed how sometimes she would like show up with big glasses, black glasses, 
And we already knew because, you know, she was being abused by the husband. I've seen um, people break down. I've seen people, I've, I've even seen someone um, kill themselves. So it, it's pretty, and I know of people who've tried to kill themselves, me included. There was a guy, I won't name him um, out of respect for his family, but he'd shown sign of, signs of depression much of the time I worked with him. He'd proposed to his girlfriend, who was only 17, so younger than him, and she said, no, I'm not ready to get married, understandably, for a young young girl. And that was it. Uh, he'd, he'd, he'd be, he focused on that and thought his life wasn't any, any longer worth living. He went to his mother's house, um, poured petrol all over his head and his body, drank it, and when she answered the door, he lit himself up. It actually took him two to three weeks to die. I think people have this bizarre notion that an animal just wanders in, not knowing what's going on, and someone sort of sneaks up behind it, kind of. Don't want to make it sound funny, because it's not, uh, and suddenly it's dead. That's not how it happens. They know, they literally know, and the, the, and the evidence is clear to anyone who witnesses it, that they're about to die. I watched them coming into the building, and some of them were almost bemused. They were like, what, what's all this? And curious even. But most of them, most of them were very, very frightened, terrified even. They didn't quite understand what was happening, but they knew it wasn't good. They didn't want to be there. You could tell the, the looks on their face, wide-eyed and terror and looking around like this and, and, and shaking and trying to back out, to get out. If you're being shepherded towards your ultimate demise, you're not going to want to go calmly. This is something that I've always held with me that there are three, well possibly four, but three main responses to when an animal's uh, about to be killed. One is the sort of fear, where it'll be trembling, cowering and trying to hide. The second is probably trying to flee, so it'll try and run away. And the third one is to fight. Whatever the reaction of those three primary responses is going to frustrate and annoy a worker at the wrong time on the wrong day and quite often you'd see someone hitting an animal inappropriately, not that there's an appropriate way to hit an animal, but hitting them, using the bolt gun on parts of the body that they shouldn't do. So instead of just going for the brain, they might be jogging it along by shooting it in the backside or uh, electrocuting it in, a, in the wrong place. So you're only supposed to electrocute the uh, pigs or the sheep on the side of the temples whereas they were using it on their haunches or their back, the shoulders, uh, even the testicle or anything, just to get it to move along. One of the reasons pe people are frustrated enough to do that kind of violence is because they're stressed and they're, they've got to process X amount of animals in X amount of time because the next lot are coming in. So if they don't get it done, they're going to have a backlog and they're going to have to work later. I remember one time seeing a sheep it had escaped from the kill floor and we were on the top story like three or four stories up and it had run all the way up there and it was running around fully conscious and aware this little lamb and panicking and you can imagine being that lamb panicking and seeing all these dead bodies and blood the smells would have been horrific and most of the people there were laughing and, and thinking this was hilarious and I and I just couldn't laugh. I thought, this is not funny. That lamb is not having a good day. It's, it's horrible. There was absolutely no guideline. Nobody say, oh, you're not supposed to do this to the chicken, or you're not supposed to kick them, or you're not supposed to treat them this way. No. That was, it, the guideline was just to get the job done. Like, you had to finish to kill these 800 chickens by this time. For one, the chickens come on crates that are all cramped up. There is like 30 chickens in one crate. And then the workers just take them out without warning. You know, they just pull them out and toss them in the room. And then somebody else come and try to catch them again by the leg. And 
placing in a court. They don't have idea what is really happening. Well, the things that, and this is the most disturbing things I saw the whole time there was when animals weren't stunned properly and they died horrible deaths. So I start with the sheep. They would come through this hole in the wall and they would spray the sheep with this mist of water. So they would spray them with water and these two metal plates would clamp up against their bodies and an electric current would go through the sheep's body. And you watch them, their muscles would tense up. They'd go bang like this and the sheep would go like this, just tense. And what was supposed to happen was the sheep would go unconscious and then have their throats cut. Um, but sometimes the, the electrical stunning didn't work. So sometimes the paddles would go back again. They would spray them with water again. The, 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 the plates would come up again. They would shock them again. And then maybe on the second time, the sheep would go unconscious. I remember at least one or two occasions, they had to shock the sheep three times before it went unconscious. And a lot of them gained, re regained consciousness just prior to having their throats cut. So then this poor sheep would be grabbed by the wool, taken back out into the yards and had to go through the process again. Now you imagine that the first time you don't know, you are the sheep coming through, you don't know what to expect, you don't know what's happening, but the second time you know what's happening and you know it's not good. God, I can't even imagine how horrible that was for them. And this didn't just happen, you know, maybe one in a thousand, this was quite common a lot of the sheep had to go through twice. And some of them regained consciousness as they were having their throats cut or shortly afterwards. I saw that happening. And you would see these animals, they'd be hooked up by their hind legs and they were thrashing in, in, around like this, their bodies. And you could tell that they had regained consciousness. In a small scale slaughterhouse I was working in, the first one I worked in, a uh, stunning would be missed, so a, a pig would have its throat cut without being first stunned, or the stunning's worn off, or in a worst case scenario, uh, which is where the screams come from mainly, uh, is where both have been missed and it's gone into the boiling tank, fully conscious, not stabbed, not stunned, and just been, well, you can imagine the kind of pain that animal must be going through to be lowered into a tank so hot that the water will boil the hair off its hide. So that is probably the worst memory I've got. I don't know, you notice when I'm talking, it's like, oh my God, like I'm holding my tears, you know, because it's a terrible experience. Like even though I didn't know nothing back there, it's something that I create, that I cause the harm to all these animals. And just like most of the time, it hits me when I go to vigils to, to get water to pigs, to, to see the baby cows, you know, to try to do something to protect them. It totally hits me. Like I was doing so much wrong before. And it's sadly, I cannot change that. You know, I cannot change that, but I'm trying to change things for the generations that are coming behind me. I wish I'd never done it. I wish I'd been brought up vegan. I feel a lot of regret and a lot of guilt. And I tell myself, and it is true, I think, I was not a bad person, I was just ignorant. I thought humans needed meat to be healthy. I thought it was a necessary evil. Now that I know it's not, it's not necessary. I just wish, I wish I hadn't done that. The best way of describing how it's traumatized me is to say that it's so many years since I was in that industry and I still have sleepless nights, probably two to three times a week. Can't sleep at all and I see it as a my punishment, I guess, for what I was involved with. <laughs>